Good morning. Let me turn down the volume a little bit. Uh, good morning. Today we're going to talk about deep learning, uh, which uh, some of you may have heard before because it's been in the news uh, quite a lot in the last few years. Uh, things like the well, very famous um, Go match against Lee Sedol. Um, so that was if the um, if you didn't if you missed it, uh, Lee Sedol was the uh, is the best human Go player in the world, and he uh, was in 2016 he was defeated by an uh, artificial Go player, which we really, as AI researchers, did not expect to happen. We thought that was quite a way off. Um, so that was done through deep learning, among some other uh, techniques. Um, and there have been quite a few news stories. Occasionally there's a little news story, Google invents this, Facebook invents that, and it's all deep learning this, deep learning that. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, let's start with some uh, motivating examples first. Uh, this is uh, research from 2014 which aims to um, automatically annotate images. So these are, basically we have a data set with, with this kind of, uh, these kinds of images and these kinds of descriptions. And we feed that to one of these deep learning systems with no extra information, no information about uh, what's in the pictures or how to interpret pictures, no information about language or how language works just a certain structure to the model, which we will talk about. And eventually the model learns for new pictures uh, to describe them, to generate a natural uh, language sentence that describes what's in the picture. It doesn't always work. So these are quite accurate, person riding a motor motorcycle on a dirt road. Here it says two dogs instead of three dogs. And here it gets it completely wrong. So it's not... 100% accurate, but the fact that we can do this at all, well, 10 years ago that would have been unbelievable. And now suddenly, uh, not only can we do it, uh, I actually had a bachelor student uh, last year who did his thesis on this subject and who just, in the sort of first two, three weeks, he built one of these systems, and then in the rest of his project he expanded on it and improved it. Uh, so not only can we do this, uh, you can do this if you put the, the time in. Uh, then we move to 2015. This is also a nice, um, nice system style transfer. Basically, given a photograph and a painting, this is a Turner painting, give me this photograph painted in the style of this painting. And this is actually done without learning, so this is, well, not strictly a machine learning project but it's built on a machine learning model for images, one of these models uh, from the previous slide that analyzes images. Uh, and the authors of this paper figured out a way to use that model to do style transfer. So this is a kind of knowledge that the model has learned and if we're clever about it, we can extract that and use it to do stuff like this. Back to learning again, this is image to image learning. Uh, so what we see here is some basic uh, basic image transformation. So this is, we know this already, right? You take a picture of a bag and you can do edge detection and you get a picture like this roughly of the edges of the bag. Uh, what they did is the other way around. So if you see this is the input and this is the output. So they generated loads of, well they started with a data set of 400 pictures of handbags. They generated the outlines which is easy enough to do. And then they fed their model with this as input and this as output and made it learn this transformation. So what you see here is actually a handbag that is generated by the model. Here we have uh, labeled street view scenes. So this is uh, hand labeled uh, views from a car that have been labeled uh, semantically annotated. So these are annotated scars, this is the road, these are trees and this is the sky. And the model learns to generate a realistic street scene from that. So this is not a photograph, this is generated by the model. It's not a photograph, this is a facade generated by the model. So that's 2016, two years ago. Uh, but these are all matched images. 
So I think mostly the same authors also ask themselves the question, what if you have images that are not matched? For instance, if you want to translate a horse into a zebra, we don't have lots of images saying this horse looks, if you translate this horse into a zebra, it looks like this. What we do have is a large bag of images of horses and a large bag of images of zebras, but we don't have them matched one to one because there are no examples of that. Um, so in 2017, they figured out a way to, um, to do that successfully. I think it's 2017. Might, I might be wrong there. Uh, and the nice thing is with this one, if you do it on all the frames of a video and you play the video, that it still looks pretty realistic. I mean, you can tell something's going on. If I showed you just this video, you could tell there was something wrong with it. But it's still pretty impressive. Considering this is trained just on a bag of images of horses and a bag of images of zebras. Uh, not only can we do impressive things, we can do... Um, uh, the, the speed of progress is quite uh, insane. So I showed you in the opening lecture, I showed you the automatically generated celebrities experiment, um, which was very recent, 2017. But recently I saw this tweet showing how much uh, we've progressed. So this is what we could do in 2014, which looks very close to the principal components analysis uh, example I showed you earlier, right? This is not that much different from the PCA example. And then uh, three or four years later, this is where we're at. And at this distance, I cannot tell that this is not a real person, that that's an auto-generated picture of a person. So exciting stuff. We can do a lot of cool stuff. And um, every year, we can do uh, a lot more cool stuff. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today. <clears throat> uh, so together with the hype, there's a lot of... Um, different explanations, a lot of different perspectives on what deep learning is, uh, what, it, what it constitutes, how we should uh, interpret this. <coughs> so I'll give you a few of those perspectives throughout the lecture because none of them are quite accurate and none of them are quite what you want. Um, so I'll start with this one, the basic explanation that you might hear a lot. Uh, deep learning is just a new name for an old, very old technique called neural networks. And in science, you occasionally, if you have a, a subject, you occasionally need to invent a new name for your subject so you get more funding. And when neural networks uh, stopped being interesting, we started calling it deep learning so that people would think we invented something new. Uh, it's not quite fair. It's also not quite unfair. Um, but let's start there. Let's start with what are neural networks and how do they, how do they work? That's the plan for today. So I'll start by explaining what neural nets are, how they work, and how they're related to a lot of the things we've already seen. A lot of the algorithms we are, we've already seen can be cast as very simple neural nets. Then the big question, how do we train them? How do we, once we have a neural net defined, how do we train it for a learning task? Uh, we do that by an algorithm called backpropagation, which is a variation on gradient descent. We're still just using gradient descent, which we've seen earlier lots of times. Hopefully, I finish that before the break. Uh, and we talk about some of the components of uh, neural networks as used in deep learning. Starting with activation functions. Moving on to layers. Specifically, uh, we're going to talk about something called a convolutional layer. And then finally, we will describe very briefly one specific architecture that you can build out of all of these components called an autoencoder. So that's the plan. <laughs> 
Um, so neural networks basically started somewhere in the 60s when people were trying to build intelligent systems, were trying to build machine learning systems, and they thought, well, we have one example of a thing, a system that can actually do this, which is our brain. So why don't we look at how the brain works, try and simplify that enough so that a computer from the 1960s can actually run it, and see whether it does anything interesting. So we start with a neuron. This is a basic brain cell. A neuron works as follows. It has a number of inputs, which I guess are on this side. So these are signals it gets from other cells. It collects them all, adds them up, analyzes them, and then based on how much input it gets from the other cell or how little input it gets from the other cell, it decides to fire, which is just sending a signal, in this case an electrical pulse, through uh, its output, and then it output, uh, its output branches out, but it, these all receive the same output signal, and these connect to other cells. And the brain is basically just a big network of these neurons connected. Uh, the, the outputs of one neuron connected to the inputs of another, and so on and so on. And I think we have about 10, 10 billion of them in our brain. Um, which is not something a 1960s computer could handle. So they started with one neuron called the perceptron. We saw a little movie at the, in the first lecture, don't know if you remember, uh, where somebody was training a machine learning system on faces, um, beetles and judges and stuff like that. Uh, that was the perceptron in action. And the perceptron works very simply. You have some inputs. These are your features in modern machine learning language. You have one feature, one input node, which is always one, called the bias node. And each node is associated with a weight, which is just a real valued number, somewhere between negative infinity and positive infinity. What you do is you take your input feature, these are all numeric features, you multiply it by the corresponding weight, you add them all up, and then you look if the result is bigger or smaller than zero. Uh, these are used as classifiers, so if it's bigger than zero, you classify it as one thing, and if it's smaller than zero, you classify it as another thing. Does this remind you of anything in terms of the mathematics? Now, this is basically the linear classifier that we've seen many times before. You just have a bunch of weights, you take the input uh, and your features, you take the dot product of the weights and the features, add a bias, and then you look if the result is higher or smaller than zero, and that's your classification. So it's called a perceptron, and it has a special way of uh, training it, not strictly by gradient descent in a slightly different way, but it's basically just a linear classifier. So they've taken this neuron, and they've reduced it so much that it became a linear classifier. But of course, the nice thing about neurons is that you can uh, use them as building blocks. You, can't just, you don't just use them in isolation, but you use them, you chain them together. You build a big network out of these things. Uh, so that's the aim of neural networks. Um, the problem is if you do that with a linear function, uh, you tend not to get any extra power out of it, because if you compose two linear functions, the result is also a linear function. So if you build a big chain of these, you put them all after the other, the result is exactly equivalent to just one of them with slightly different weights. So you might, yeah, there's really no point to it unless you add some non-linearity. You add somewhere some non-linear aspect and as it happens, the, uh, the nonlinear function, the nonlinearity that was added most uh, uh, in the early days of neural network, most often, that was used most often, is one we've seen already, called the, sig the logistic sigmoid function, which we saw in um, logistic regression. So that's, uh, yeah, if you want to um, build a network that does something useful out of... Uh, multiple uh, of these perceptron units, what you should do is 
add a little non-linearity at the end. So basically here's the formula. You do the same thing we did before. You take your features, you multiply them with weights, you add a bias. But you take the result of that and you pass it through this non-linear function. So the perceptron, by setting it, its weights, is free to scale the output linearly, uh, put it anywhere between minus infinity and negative infinity. It has all that range to do what it wants with the output. And then the logistic sigmoid squeezes that whole, range, whole domain into the range between 0 and 1. So the output of your neuron is always between 0 and 1, and that goes into another neuron, and so on and so on. And then because of that nonlinearity, you have a chance of doing something that one linear unit can't do. You have a chance of learning nonlinear functions. The most, um, <clears throat> the most popular way to combine these was in something called a multi-layer perceptron, which sounds very intimidating, but it's actually very simple. Basically, we start with one layer of input units, then one layer called the hidden layer of these um, sigmoid outputs. And as you can see, every uh, layer on, uh, sorry, every node on the input layer is connected to every node on the hidden layer. And then we move everything to an output layer and every, between two layers, every node is connected with every other node. But within a layer, no nodes are connected and everything moves from the input to the output. And usually we have only one hidden layer. And as you can see here, we have sigmoid activation units on the hidden layer, and then the output layer is linear again. And usually if you number the weights uh, independently, you get uh, the weight from node 1 to node 2, from node 1 in the input to node 2 in the hidden layer, is called W12, and here we get just uh, V2. Um, now, it may not be immediately obvious just from this picture, the first time you see it, but essentially what we're doing here, if we ignore the sigmoids, is just matrix multiplication. We have lots of weights, and we multiply each uh, part of the input by a unique weight. Then we sum them. Um, so basically, if you... Uh, so here it is in uh, formulas. So x1 by is multiplied by w12. Sigmoid is passed over it, and then for uh, to get the output of y, we multiply its inputs h1 through h3. I've missed out h3. We multiply its inputs by their respective weights and add the bias node. Um, so if you write this down in matrix notation, you end up with this. So x becomes a vector. We just take these nodes and stick them in a vector. We multiply it by a big weight matrix W. We just put all these weights, arrange them in a matrix. Uh, we get the result of this is one vector. Let's call it K. We pass that element-wise through the sigmoid. We apply the sigmoid to each element of that vector. So then we get H, which is also a vector. And we multiply H by V and add C. So the neural network description, the, the network diagram is just a way to express this, um, this matrix multiplication. But behind the scenes or underwater, all we're doing is multiplying matrices, doing these linear transformations between vectors, and adding a tiny little bit of nonlinearity in between each step. Uh, one way to look at this is if you think back to, uh, I think it was last week this time, we talked about uh, using the cross products of uh, features. So taking the features that you have and combining them and extending them to make more features so that uh, a nonlinear problem becomes linear. And you basically project your features into a higher dimensional space so that the problem becomes, the classification problem becomes easier. And one thing we saw was that this problem, this XOR problem as it's called, becomes linearly separable if you add one feature, which is the product of the two original features. 
And you can think uh, of the two-layer neural network as basically doing this as well, but instead of hand coding these new features, hand coding this higher dimensional space, you're learning it. So you have one layer of feature extraction which takes the original features and expands them into a higher dimensional space of more features. And then on top of that we have a linear regression layer because this is just a linear classifier for these features. Um, so that's for linear regression. Remember we have a linear output unit here, so the output can be anywhere between negative infinity and positive infinity. Uh, if we want to do binary classification, we've sort of seen this trick already in uh, the logistic regression lecture. We just add a sigmoid to both units. So it looks like this. Just put a sigmoid here. So now the output is all also uh, squeezed into the range 0 and 1. And what you essentially end up with is one layer of feature extraction like before, and the top layer is exactly equivalent to doing logistic regression, which we've seen earlier. Uh, one early success story of this was the Elfin system, which I, already, uh, I also showed you in the opening lecture. Uh, which in 1995, uh, they basically built this setup. They put a camera on top of a <clears throat> on top of a, um, a van or a car. Uh, the sensor image was reduced to about 32 by 30 pixels, and that was used. Uh, these were used as inputs to one of these multi-layer perceptrons, fed to just well, there are five networks here. I think the original. Architecture had four networks, uh, four nodes in the middle, and these were translated to 32 output units that were interpreted as saying steer all the way left to steer all the way right, and the middle one said don't uh, don't touch the steering wheel, just go straight. And then it was trained on the behavior of a human driver, and it could predict this. And after training, apparently they could uh, the network was so good that they could drive coast to coast with this in America. So we have a little uh, demonstration now. This is a website called playground.tensorflow.org. What's it saying? No oh, update. It always picks the best moment to remind me for the updates. All right. So, website called playground.tensorflow.org, where you can basically play around with a very small neural network. So, here we have a data set, and our aim is to find a classifier for this circular data set. Uh, this one has two hidden layers and two inputs and a couple of hyperparameters and some aspects of the learning problem. And like I said, most of the things we've already seen are instances of very simple neural networks, one layer neural networks. So let's start there. Let's remove the layers. And in fact, let's use this data set so you can see that uh, what I'm saying actually works. So this is the data set we saw earlier. This is this XOR data set, which is not linearly separable. And if we train now, this is basic gradient descent. It starts training and you can see it doesn't really find a good, uh, good classification. Uh, now what we can do is we can add cross product. So this is the, this is the product of x1 and x2, of the horizontal and the vertical. And if we give the linear classifier this, then you can see it almost immediately learns to classify properly. But the idea of neural networks is that we add a hidden layer so that it can learn to do this on its own.
So we don't give it any extra features, but we do give it some hidden neurons. Uh, you set the activation function, which is this nonlinearity, set, set it to the sigmoid function. Oh, maybe I should reset. Uh, let's take a different, uh, different learning task. So now we have this uh, cloud of points in the middle and then a ring of, points around, of orange points around it. If I set it to learn, it doesn't seem to be doing much. And you can see it slowly converges to a good classification. Uh, this is a probabilistic classifier, so the orange points have high probability orange, the blue points have high probability blue, the white points have a sort of 50-50. It becomes a bit clearer if I just make it a, a regular classifier, so it just picks the highest probability class. And then if we have a very difficult data set, like this, so we have these, uh, the learning task here is these two spirals that are spiraled into each other. We can add a little bit more layers and neurons. Oh, not that much. So let's do two layers and seven neuron e neurons each. I don't know if this is going to work for this problem. This is quite a difficult problem to solve, but let's just see if it does anything. No, so far it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not really doing anything. Let's try once more before moving on with a different activation. We'll talk about this activation after the break. Oh yeah, it's done a little bit. So you can see it's slightly starting to move towards it but it's having a little bit of trouble with it. But it's slowly learning this very, very non-linear classification. So like I said, uh, playground.tensorflow.org. Uh, please have a look at this and play around with this yourself. It's very instructive and a lot of fun. So I've left myself 15 minutes for backpropagation, which is going to be uh, a problem. So we might run into the break a little bit. Uh, we might, uh, I mean, do backpropagation after the break. Um, before that, we need to talk about some of our building blocks, basically, because we do this in we do this kind of learning, this kind of model building in systems like TensorFlow or PyTorch which uh, uh, TensorFlow you will meet in the fourth worksheet. We will talk to it through Keras, which is a, an interface that makes it a little bit more friendly. And these are, uh, it's called TensorFlow because the basic building blocks of the system are tensors. What you've already seen, if you've done the worksheets, you've worked with NumPy. The basic building blocks of NumPy are also tensors. Uh, and it may sound a little intimidating, but it's nothing more than a generalization of what a matrix is. So basically we have a scalar, which is just a number, which you might call a zero tensor. Nobody does, but technically that's what you could call it. Uh, oh, the animation goes the wrong way around, so let's just forget the animation. We have a vector, which is what you call a one tensor. Uh, there should be something. Ah, there we go. Which has one number to define its shape, namely its length. The vector has a number of units in it, so its shape is three. Then we have a matrix, which has two dimensions, so it has a shape two by three, uh, sorry, three by two. So that's what we call a two tensor, because it has two dimensions. And a three tensor is just a, two t uh, a bunch of two tensors stacked on top of each other. So this is just a collection 
of a bunch of two tensors makes it a three tensor. So it has three dimensions, which gives it a shape two by three by two. And then once you go to a four tensor and higher dimensions, it becomes very difficult to draw. Usually I visualize it like this for myself because a four tensor is basically a bunch of three tensors stacked on top of each other in a new dimension. So you have a fourth dimension, so that doesn't really, uh, you can't really draw that very easily. Uh, but I usually draw it like this. So it's just a collection of, uh, of three tensors. And this is a very uh, useful framework to represent lots of data. For instance, the kind of data matrix that we've already seen is just, it's a matrix, so it's a two tensor. So if you have a matrix like this, which we saw in the opening lecture, uh, we tend to just represent X, the features as a matrix X, and then the classes as a vector of class labels. So that's a two tensor and a one tensor, or a matrix and a vector. Uh, if we have images, you may know that uh, a pixel in an image is composed of three values, how much red there is in it, how much green there is in it, and how much blue there is in it. So that's a sort of vector. You can have a, represent a pixel as a vector. So a color image is usually represented as a three tensor with a width and a height. These are just the, the pixels. And then for each pixel, you have three channels. Uh, so you get uh, sort of three slices through this tensor are the three image channels, and if you add those all up, you get a picture. Then if you have a data set of images, that becomes a four tensor, because you have a sequence of images, and you stick them all together, you get a four-dimensional tens uh, tensor. And just to prove that this is not just some fancy idea, but this is actually how it works, if you import from Keras data set, import a data set called CIFAR10, which is a famous image classification data set. It looks like this. If you run this in an IPython notebook, a Jupyter notebook, you get the data, you get a training data, training labels, test data, test labels, and if you ask for the shape, you get a four tensor. So it's pictures of three, image, uh, three color channels of 32 by 32 pixels, and there are 50,000 images. So that's how tensors work. And tensors are these basic building blocks of uh, neural networks. And then we build layers with these things. And layers you can build in lots of different ways, but the basic rules are this. Anything that is a differentiable function from one tensor to another tensor, one type of tensor to another type of tensor, can be a layer. Uh, the what's called a dense layer or an MLP layer, the ones we've already seen, uh, these fully connected layers go from a vector to a vector and they are parameterized by a weight matrix. So you get an input vector, you multiply it by the weight matrix and you get an output. And we'll see some other layers after the break, convolutional layers and max pooling. And then these nonlinear activations uh, are usually also defined as separate layers these days. So that's called an activation layer. And we've seen sigmoid, and after the break we'll, see, we'll also see ReLU, Softmax, and Softplus. So that's how to define your model and how to set up the parameters. So the next question is how do we choose these parameters? How do we figure out what, given a learning problem, how do we figure out what good weights are to do, do the learning problem? Uh, and we need two things to get from what we know already, gradient descent, to the standard learning algorithm for uh, neural networks. Uh, first, we're going to turn gradient descent into stochastic gradient descent, which is a very easy transformation. And then we're going to turn that into backpropagation, which basically starts with the loss at the top, computes the loss for the gradient, and propagates the gradient, propagates the error, all the way down the network. Uh, so stochastic gradient descent is very simple. In normal gradient descent, we pick some random starting weights and we compute the gradient uh, with respect to the loss over the whole data. And stochastic gradient descent just picks one data point, computes the gradient of the loss with respect to just that one, one data point, 
and then you take a step, uh, a, a step in the opposite direction of the gradient for every data point. And it's called stochastic gradient descent because it's basically like every step, you're sampling a point from your data distribution, computing the gradient, and moving in that direction. So the way you move around is a lot more random because the loss for one point or the, the direction you should move to optimize your model for this point is usually very different from the direction you should move to optimize, optimize your model for that point. Uh, but if you take small steps, then it averages out to roughly the same thing, except that uh, it's a lot faster, you have low memory overhead. Uh, the stochasticity helps to escape local, mi local maxima. We saw this also in the second lecture, that if we do pure gradient descent, it tends to beeline for this local maximum. And usually you want, at least in your early learning stage, a little randomness to actually escape these and get to, the glo to a, a global maximum or a, more, a better maximum at least. Um, and usually what we do, we don't, just, we don't do this, but we do something called mini-batching, where um, we're sort of halfway between the pure stochastic gradient descent and gradient descent over the whole data. Uh, instead of picking one data point here, we pick a batch of data points, something like 32 data points. And we compute the loss with respect to that mini-batch of 32 data points. So you can add a couple of points to compute your gradient over to smooth it out a little bit but you don't have to compute it over your whole data set, which makes things a lot faster and uh, makes it work better. But the batch size is another hyperparameter. You have to pick your batch size and how you set your batch size tends to influence uh, learning a lot. But this is how it's basically done, stochastic gradient descent. Now this is the sort of models we tend to build in deep learning. This is AlexNet, it's a big old model and uh, the differentiable neural computer by DeepMind. In this case, every arrow here is, uh, is a neural network called an LSTM, which are very complicated neural networks. Uh, so this represents huge neural networks with lots and lots of layers and millions of units. So this is very complicated. Uh, so at this point, we don't want to compute the gradient by hand anymore. If you remember these slides, I showed you uh, two slides first for linear regression then for logistic regression with derivations of the gradient which were very difficult to follow and difficult to do. I made lots of mistakes when I uh, wrote those. Uh, and that was just for linear regression, right? That was just for one layer or logistic regression. So for this it's just it's just impossible to do it by hand. We need some way for the computer to, compu to work out the gradient for us to do all this calculus for us so that we don't have to do it anymore. There are a couple of ways of doing that. Firstly, you can do it numerically. You can approximate the gradient. So it's just if I want to know the gradient for this point, I pick two points nearby and I fit a line through it, and that's my gradient. And then I take a step in the direction where that line decreases the most. So I can do this in, in multiple dimensions. I just pick some nearby points and fit a line through it. This is basically what random search was doing that we uh, saw in the second lecture. Uh, so this is very nice, it's very simple to implement. You don't need to actually look at the form of the function. All you need to do is evaluate the function at a couple of points, uh, compute the loss at these points. So you don't really need to do any calculus at all. But you also lose a lot of power. This is very inaccurate. Another way is to um, realize that what we, when we take the derivative, what we do is very mechanical. Basically, you can always, almost always find the derivative of a function, which tells you that a computer program could probably do it as well. If we just take the rules that we use on paper and put them into a computer, then the computer can be used to find the derivative for us, which is what Wolfram Alpha does. If you need a derivative and you don't feel like doing it yourself, or if you want to check your work, you just go to Wolfram Alpha, you type in something like this, and you try a couple of times before it understands what you're talking about, and then it says something like this. I think you want the derivative of this function, which I've computed, and it looks like this. So it's just doing everything we do on paper in calculus, it's just doing in the computer. <laughs> 
this is very expensive to do. This is, uh, at worst, this is an NP-hard problem. So sometimes it's just too expensive to do. And if you do this for a massive neural network, uh, this is going to look hideous and it's probably not going to work. So what we need is an in-between solution. Something called autodiff. Which, on the one hand, uses the fact that we know what the function look like, looks like. We know what the function looks like and we can, at least in principle, compute its gradient. On the other hand, it doesn't take the whole function and turns it into one purely symbolic expression of the gradient. So locally we use the shape of the function, locally we use calculus, and then globally we use numeric approximations or numeric functions. The idea being that if we describe our system as a composition of modules, so we make it modular, and the output is just the result of taking this function, applying it to the output of this function, which is applied to the output of this function, and so on and so on and so on. Then repeated application of the chain rule turns the gradient into the product of the gradient of each module. Because our neural network is the composition of lots of functions, of lots of layers, we can just use the chain rule over and over again. And turn the derivative into this big product of uh, local derivatives. Uh, so I think that's a good time to take a break. And after the break, we're going to see how to use this principle to take the derivative of the sigmoid as a starting simple example. All right, I'll see you in 15 minutes. All right, thank you. Uh, so this is where we left off. We were going to try and find a, a, a way of doing automatic back, uh, sorry, automatic differentiation so we don't have to work out all these uh, complicated derivatives by hand anymore. And we're going to do this with a method called autodiff. Uh, and this is our first example. So we have a function. I just picked some random uh, well, not random, but I picked the logistic function as something uh, that we can use as a very simple example. So we want the derivative of this with respect to its argument. The first thing we do is we decompose the module as a uh, composition, uh, sorry, we decompose the function as a decomposition of what we'll call modules. So we decompo decompose it as a sequence of very simple functions. And normally you wouldn't go this low down. Normally you wouldn't decompose it this finely, but it helps to explain it. Uh, it helps to explain the principle. So basically, what we have the function uh, uh, sigma is the composition of the functions a, b, c, and d. So if we take the argument, we pass it to the function a, we get the negative. We pass the result of that to the function b, we get e to the power of the negative of x. We pass the result of that to the function c, we get one plus e to the power of the negative of x, and we pass that to the, through the function d, we get 1 over c. So sigma is uh, d of c of b of a of x. And we get this computation graph. In this case, a computation line that tells us how d depends on x. And we want the derivative of d with respect to x. That's the derivative we're after. So now with this computation graph, we can express the derivative that we're interested in using the chain rule. Because the chain rule allows us to take two composed graphs and split them up. So if we apply the chain rule repeatedly, then the derivative of d with respect to x is just d with respect to c, c with respect to b, b to a, a to x. So you can see this one recurs here, this one here, this one here, this one here. So our whole function that we're interested in is just a big product of these things. Uh, so we leave it there for now. We say this is our derivative. We don't work this out yet. And we do a forward pass. So this is where, we, where things differ from the way we did it before. Before, 
we work this out uh, in general, and we worked out a function that works for every x. We work out a, a functional description of our derivative. We don't do that here. We first we pick x. So let's say zero. We do uh, what's called a forward pass. So we just compute the output. We just compute this function for x by setting x here as zero and computing forward. So we get zero e to the power of zero. Uh, this becomes minus zero. E to the power of minus zero is one. One plus e to the power of minus zero is two. And one over two is two. So for all the intermediate values, we now have a numeric value after our forward pass. So we go back to our chain rule. And we fill in the derivatives, but only locally. So we take the derivative of d with respect to c. Well, 1 over c, the derivative of that is minus 1 over c to the power of 2. That's just the derivative of 1 over something is, uh, is this. So we take the derivative, but we don't fill it in. We don't fill in what c is. We don't fill in the functional form of c. We just leave it like this. So we only take the derivative locally. For each module, we only take the derivative with respect to its argument. We only take the derivative of b with respect to a, but we don't fill in what a is. So we get this for all these derivatives. And that's when we stop doing things symbolically and when we switch to the numeric approach. So once we have this, we fill in the numbers we had from the forward pass. So now we know that c is 2. So this is 1 over 2 squared negative 1 over 2 squared. Uh, here we don't have to fill anything in. Here we know that a is 0, so this becomes 1. So the result, oh, sorry, the result becomes 1 over 4. So this is this combination of symbolic and numeric uh, taking of the derivative. We t do it symbolically locally, and then we fill in the numbers we had from the forward pass. Uh, which basically works out this way. You get the forward pass is just computing the output, and then you get a backward pass which computes your gradient. Uh, we don't always have a nice linear graph like this. Sometimes our graph looks like this. So we have one output, which is the, uh, oh, arrow is the wrong way here, sorry, arrow should all the arrows should be pointing in that direction. So we have one output, which is a function of two inputs, b and c, uh, a and b, sorry. And a and b both depend on w. So let's say we're taking the derivative of c with respect to w. Uh, then c basically gets gradient information from two channels, from this channel and this channel. So in order to deal with that, oh yeah, sorry. Um, and one place you see this is in this mini batching. So if we compute the loss function with respect to three examples for some big neural network, what we're essentially doing is we are computing the neural network in parallel three times for three different inputs. We get three different outputs, y1, y2, and y3. We compare them to three different target values, t1, t2, and t3. And we compute the error for each one of these. So this might be the squared error, for instance. And then we sum those. So if we're interested, if we want to compute the gradient of this mini batch with respect to one of the parameters, let's say w1, w11, we want to derive the partial derivative for this value with respect to this parameter. We see that the parameter occurs three times in this whole computation graph leading to the loss. So in order to deal with that, we need something called the multivariate chain rule, which just says, if you have two, uh, so we want the derivative of c with respect to w, and we have two paths through which w can end up at c, we just use the chain rule for both. So c with respect to a, times a with respect to w, and c with respect to w, uh, sorry, c with respect to b, times b with respect to w, and we sum them, which makes sense. Basically, 
if we're computing the gradient for this, um, this weight W, what this says is we get three signals. So this output tells us the weight should go in that direction. This output tells us the weight should go in that direction. And this output tells us the weight should go in that direction. And we just sum all these directions uh, to combine the gradients, to combine all this gradient information. So second example, let's make this a bit more uh, realistic. We're going to do something uh, analogous to linear regression, but we're going to make it very simple. So we just have one feature, x, and our model is to add one value, w, to that, and the output is y. And we do it on this data. So the input here is 2, and the output should be 3. The input here is 4, and the output should be 5. So this is x. Uh, this target for y is this. So what should w be in this case for this data? What's the ideal model? 1, yes. So we add 1 to this, we end up with this. So w should be 1, but we're going to look for it. We're going to use all these methods to find w uh, rather than read it out of the table. Um, so per example, we compute the square uh, loss, the square of the error. So we take the output of the model minus the target value. We take the square and we sum it for all examples in the data. And if we write that out, then our loss function l looks like this. So it's the, uh, uh, for x here, this is what the model evaluates to minus what the model should evaluate to. We square that and we sum it for the data. And this should be a 5. Sorry. So that's our function, L, that we're interested in. And we want to take the derivative of L with respect to W, so that we can look for a good W by following gradient. So we decompose L into B plus D, where B and D are both squares of A and C, respectively. And A and C are these residuals. And then our computation graph looks like this. So it has this fan out, fan in structure, the multivariate thing that we saw earlier. So we use the multivariate, uh, multivariate um, chain rule, and we write it down like this. So the derivative of L with respect to W is the chain rule along this path plus the chain rule along this path. And then we fill in the local derivatives. So for each of these factors, we fill in locally the derivative. So L, the derivative of L with respect to B plus D, uh, sorry, with respect to B, is just 1. There's nothing interesting is happening here. Uh, here, the derivative of this with respect to A is 2A, because you just use the exponent rule. Exponent goes in front, we end up with 2A. And here we get 1 again, because it's a linear function. And on this side, we also get 1 times 2C plus 1, uh, times 1. <laughs> And then we keep it there. So if we were doing normal differentiation, we, we would fill in A here. But we don't do that. We keep it local. We do a forward pass for, let's say, W is 0. So we, can, we do a forward pass to compute L. These are all our intermediate values. We end up with a loss of 2. And then we fill in the intermediate values. So minus 1 here and minus 1 here and we end up with minus 2. So that's our derivative for this function. Uh, that principle is called backpropagation. And that's how gradients for neural networks are computed. The rules in um, systems like TensorFlow and systems like PyTorch, when you compute, or, or sorry, when you define one of these nodes in your computation graph, these are what you have to implement. You have to implement a forward function which computes the output given the inputs. So just in this direction, you get given some inputs, compute the outputs. And then your, back, uh, your backward function computes the local uh, derivative. So here you get, if, the, imagine, if you imagine this is a big, one layer in a big stack of layers, the forward you get given the input so far up to this point 
compute the output. And for the backward, you get given the gradient so far up to this point. So you get given sort of the product going from left to right of this chain rule up to this point. And then you have to compute this value and multiply it by this and give them the result. And if you implement these two things, then Autodiff can just take the derivative. And what I've done in these examples is I've decomposed the function into very small pieces. That's not strictly necessary. You can make it bigger pieces. Uh, so basically what you want to do is make the pieces big enough that you can still uh, work out the gradient yourself and compute it and then chain those pieces together into a system that is so big that you can't work out the gradient anymore. Uh, let me see. Uh, so these are the rules, basically, uh, in these uh, autodiff systems. The computation graph should be a directed acyclic graph, so no cycles. Uh, and we have output impu outputs, inputs, and intermediate values, like weights. These are all tensors, but the output is a single scalar. The output of your computation graph should always be one number, which doesn't mean that deep learning models can't output something more complex than one number because we saw very interesting models that output pictures and we have models that output language. Uh, but the whole computation graph is always your model, which uh, gets a tensor as an input and a tensor as an output. And on top of that, your loss which compares the output to a target value and returns a single number. So your loss should always be a single number, and that should always be the end of your computation graph, so that you could take a derivative with respect to one, uh, for one number with respect to the weights. And these nodes, they implement a forward and a backward function. So this is how these modern autodiff systems work. That doesn't mean you can't do backpropagation without one of these autodiff systems. Uh, before we had these, uh, you know, uh, neural networks existed for, for lots of, uh, for many decades before we had these systems. Uh, what we did is just, we did this autodiff thing on paper. We just computed these local gradients and then implemented backpropagation with that. So a little summary, backpropagation aka autodiff. What it does, it distributes the error, the loss, back down the neural network, or whatever it is, any kind of computation graph. It's sort of half symbolic, half numeric way of computing the gradient. And ultimately, the end of this is that we can define our computation graph, we define our neural network, and let the system take care of the rest. But it is important to understand what it's doing because we need to tune its behavior. So you need to sort of understand how all this works. Uh, very quickly, an analogy of how this works in neural networks. Imagine this is your neural network. At the top we have the prime minister node, which is the node that makes the decision for us. And below him are his ministers. These are old slides, so this is from one or two cabinets ago. Uh, but below him are his ministers we, who advise him. So they each have a, a weight, a level to an extent to which he trusts his ministers. And then the ministers all listen to nodes below them, which are civil servants. We ask the neural network a question, should we ban lollipops? Civil servants say what they think. The ministers listen to what the civil servants say, and the prime minister listens to what the ministers say. And the level of trust can be positive or negative. So sometimes, uh, oh, I'm going too fast. So if the level of trust is positive and this guy says, yes, you should do it, then he takes that on board as a positive. So then he is more inclined to uh, think that that should be done. If the level of trust is negative, so this one doesn't trust this one, then if this one says, yes, you should do it, this one says, this one thinks we probably shouldn't do it. And this is how we combine uh, these influences. So we propagate all that up and we sum everything we know and we end up with the decision. And that decision is either wrong or right. So we, get, we compare 
the output to the value we get from the data set, and we say, well done, or bad job, and then we look back. So he tr we trusted this minister, and this minister told us to do what we did, so we tell this minister, well done, good job. We take our error that we got, and we, in this case, a positive uh, value, and we distribute it to the nodes depending on us. And if we did what this guy said we should do, we say, well done. And if we did what this guy said we should do, we say, well done. And if this guy told us to do the opposite, but we didn't follow his advice, then we say, bad job. So we distrust him even more. So two things are happening. We are propagating the error. We are distributing the error. So we are punishing our subordinates or rewarding our subordinates. And we are adjusting our levels of trust. So we listened to this guy and everything worked out okay. So we trust this guy even more the next time. And we distrust this guy even more the next time. If, oh, sorry, yeah? Uh, you know from the training data. So this is basically, this guy gives the classification, and then we know from the training data whether the classification was correct or not. So that's our residual, and that's what we're going to propagate down to the network. That's sort of the analogy I'm, I'm making. So if it works out the other way around, if we did something wrong, we did a bad job, then everything's flipped around. So the guy we trusted and whose advice we followed, we now tell him he did a bad job, so we tick him off, and he gets angry, so he's going to tick off his subordinates. So everyone he trusted, he's going to tell bad job, and he's going to trust less next time. And the guy he distrusted, he didn't do what he did last time, he's going to say, sorry, well done, and trust him a little bit more next time. And all of this fall, falls out of backpropagation. If you just write down the neural network, you work out the backpropagation, you get this behavior. So we get a, an error at the top of the network and we propagate it down to the nodes and we adjust our weights based on that. So we get a new perspective on deep learning because we call these things neural networks, because you can write them down as networks and they were inspired by neurons 50 years ago. But I hope you understand that there's not really that much to do with neurons and networks anymore. It's mo mostly just compositions of many mostly linear functions and a little bit of nonlinearity. So that's backpropagation. I've ticked it off already. That's how we train neural networks. So now let's look at what kind of things we can build. We have a little bag of tools now. How can we combine these and put these things together? So first question is how do we make these neural networks deep? So everything I've described so far has already existed since the 80s. Neural networks has, have existed uh, for ages. And the reason we suddenly started talking about deep learning instead of neural networks is that we figured out a way to make them deep, to build neural networks not just with two layers or one hidden layer, but lots and lots and lots of layers. And that was a big, a big breakthrough. We couldn't do that for a really long time. We wanted to, but we couldn't figure out how to do it. We had a few very ad hoc methods, and then we figured out just how to do it properly. And it turned out, after lots of... Uh, getting sidetracked and lots of different uh, solu difficult solutions. All you need to do is make sure that when you initialize your network, so when you pick your random weights to start with, you should ensure that the initial weight should be chosen so that the data is kept centered and the variance is kept at a fixed function. So if your input data has mean 0 and variance 1, in all directions, as it should, let's assume we normalize our data, then at every layer, the resulting uh, vectors computed at every layer should also have mean zero and variance one. Because if you don't, uh, 
and you apply one of these uh, sigmoids, for instance, one of these activation functions. And if every time you apply one of these layers, the variance increases a little bit. So let's say the mean stays zero, but the variance increases a little bit by 1.1. You get this blow up of your values. They get bigger and bigger and bigger. And per unit, per neuron, the uh, input to the sigmoid is going to get more and more extreme, either more on this side or more on this side. And what you can see is that the gradient, so the local gradient of this, just this function, it's going to be here, it's going to be very flat, or here it's going to be very flat. Now mathematically that doesn't make much of any difference because it's, it's never exactly flat. It's always slightly diagonal. But we are working on computers, we have finite precision. So once this gets to 10 or 20, you cannot really distinguish this from a purely flat gradient. Basically. Uh, from the computer's point of view, once you're in this area, your gradient is zero. Which means gradient descent doesn't do anything anymore. You don't get any updates. Your weights don't change anymore on the gradient descent. And if that happens just after you've initialized your parameters, then you don't, you don't start learning, basically. So learning doesn't work anymore. So in order to stop this problem, you need to ensure that when you initialize your neural network, uh, you get a gradient signal. You get a gradient signal all the way from the top to the bottom, and you get non-zero gradients down here. Otherwise, learning doesn't start, uh, and you can't have a deep neural network. A couple of ways to do that. You can initialize your weight matrix as a random orthogonal matrix, which if you think back to these, uh, these eigenvalues that we talked about a few weeks ago, are, is just a matrix that transforms... Um, transforms your input, but doesn't uh, 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 only rotates it. So if you have a vector, it can rotate the vector, but it can change its length, right? So if you do that, you know that uh, the variance is going to stay the same, as is the uh, mean. Or you can do uh, what's called chloro-uniform initialization, where you pick each weight individually as a random value between these two a uh, uniform random value between these two various values, where n is the number of input units, out, n out is the number of output units. Uh, I won't go into why this is the way it is, it just, you can work this out and it works. And if you initialize with one of these schemes, then you can have a deep neural network and you can just train it with basic gradient descent. So let's talk about activation functions. Um, so we've seen the sigmoid function. It turns out the sigmoid function for hidden units, so for units in the middle of the network, isn't actually that useful. Because you have a lot of problems with these um, vanishing gradients here on this side if your activations get too big or too small. And on this side, the biggest your activation can be, sorry, the biggest your gradient can be, is 0 0.25. So if you're multiplying gradients back down the network, uh, you're quartering your gradient every time you go through one of these sigmoid units. So you really need to adjust your weights in order to compensate for that, and that's really complicated. So that doesn't really work. What we use instead is something called a ReLU unit, a rectified linear unit, which looks like this. Very simple. It's just linear. If it's above 0, and below zero, it just clips everything to zero. And the nice thing here is that you have a derivative either of one or of zero. So you add very little nonlinearity, uh, but just enough to make the network work. And your gradients just pass through. So it doesn't do, doesn't shrink or blow up the gradient. It's very nice. Uh, so that's hidden units, usually ReLUs. Output units are a very different story because the output you want to shape and you want to transform into a certain shape. So let's say, for instance, you want to do something called uh, multi-class classification. So this is binary classification, which we've seen already. Basically, your top layer is a logistic regression, does logistic regression. Uh, 
but we can only do that with binary classification because this node gives us a value between 0 and 1, which we can take as the probability of the positive class. So then we know the probability of the negative class because there are only two classes. If we have more than two classes, we need more nodes. More nodes. So we have a target value here. We have three classes and a one hot coded target value. So it says in this case the middle class is true. And the network has three output nodes which somehow need to indicate which of the classes the network thinks is true. And wouldn't it be nice if, like with logistic regression, we could take these as probabilities? So the data set tells us with probability one, I think, that this class is true. And then we compare it to the probabilities given by the network. So we make sure that these output nodes always sum to one. We interpret them as probabilities. And then we apply cross entropy as a loss function. We can do that with something called a softmax layer, which basically takes the linear outputs, takes the exponential, and it takes the exponential of the linear output of this and sums it by all of the values here. So you just uh, take the exponential and normalize it. And then you know that they sum to one. And you can use uh, cross entropy. In this case, it's called categorical cross entropy. This is called a categorical distribution. So it's called categorical cross entropy. And that's a loss function for multi class classification. Uh, yeah, and there's some other values you can also use uh, to shape your output. If you have output that needs to be a certain shape, that needs to be in a certain interval, that needs to be always positive, um, you can use all of these functions to, to shape it and uh, the gradient will just pass uh, through it again if you use out to diff. Just make sure that you don't kill the gradient. So if you, use a if you apply a function like this to your output, then afterwards the gradient is always zero. So anything below here is not going to have any gradient information. So if you want to mess with your output, if you want to shape it a little bit, it needs to be somehow with smooth differentiable functions. Otherwise you kill your gradient. Uh, I'm going to quickly rush through this a little bit, but I hope most of it will still be reasonably um, coherent. Uh, so the one type of layer we've seen now is uh, called a dense layer, which is just a fully connected layer. You take all of your input nodes and you connect every input node to every one of your output nodes. And if you feed it an image, you just flatten the image into a long row of pixel values and you feed it through a densely connected network. So this is very expensive. If your image is high resolution, you get lots and lots of weights, even for a deep neural network. And your gradient information, so your error signal, has to be distributed over all of these weights. So it sort of diffuses a lot. Uh, and we are not using information that we have. We have a lot of information about the structure of our input, which we're just throwing away by flattening it into a vector. We know that these pixels are all close to each other here. Uh, so they're probably correlated and if you want to analyze part of the image that's probably useful to know that these pixels are related and that you should look at those together. Uh, and that's what a convolutional layer does for us. It doesn't flatten the input, it keeps it structured. So let's say our image is a 25 by 25 uh, pixel image we keep those input, uh, input nodes, those pixels, we keep them arranged in a grid like they are in the image. And then we're going to build up our hidden layer bit by bit. Basically what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to cut out as many of these connections as we can. And we're going to clamp a lot of the weights together. We're going to say a lot of the weights are the same as other weights. And we do it in the following way. So for every group of, let's say, four neurons here, 
every patch of four neurons here, two by two, we add one hidden layer with just four connections. Uh, sorry, one hidden node, sorry. We add one node to the hidden layer with just four connections, one, two, three, and four. And then we slide the patch down over the image and we add a new hidden node for every four by four patch with four new connections. And we say the connections here are the same. So this connection to the top left pixel is the same as this connection here to the top left pixel. So we do that for lots of, for all of the patches. So we get a four by four grid of hidden nodes. And remember, this whole thing is defined in just four weights. Because for every hidden node, the weights are shared. So there are four weights. And if we want a little bit more power, we can do the same thing again with different weights. So now we have a input layer of 25 nodes and a hidden layer of 32 nodes with just eight weights in total, repeated again and again to connect these two neurons. So this reduces the, the uh, problem a lot uh, and works very well in, in principle. Um, and what you then do is you build up a long network with lots of these convolutions. So you take a patch, you reduce it, and you do that a couple of times. So these are separate ones of these, uh, what we call maps. And as you go through the network, you increase the number of maps and you decrease the resolution. So as you see here, we go from essentially one image of five by five to two images of four by four. These are called uh, maps or filters or kernels. We go from one image of five by five to two images of four by four. Uh, we can also do something called max pooling to reduce the uh, resolution even more. And as you go through the network, you apply more and more convolutions and occasionally these max pooling things. Uh, you reduce the resolution and you increase the number of images. So this is like a very low resolution image with lots of channels. Uh, here's what it looks like in uh, Keras. This is what you're doing, you'll be doing in the fourth worksheet. So you just build a model, sequential model, you add a convolution, you add another convolution, you add one of these max pooling things, drop out, I'll explain later. And at the end you add a couple of dense layers, a couple of fully connected layers. And you get a model. You tell what optimizer to use, so this is kind of a gradient descent style thing. And then you fit the model. And that's all you need to do. So what do these filters do? If you've done a bit of image analysis, you'll recognize them actually as convolutional filters. Um, what they do depends on how you set the weights. But this is one thing they, um, they are likely to do, if, especially if you initialize it randomly, this is probably the filter you're going to get. So what it does here, it applies a blur to the input image. So it takes the neighboring, it, uh, the, the node in the new image is a mixture of the neighboring nodes. So if you take just a roughly equal mixture, you get a blur. You get a blurry image of your input. Now that might seem initially to be less valuable. You've reduced it, uh, the input image from this to this. But actually what you've done is you've created a representation that is invariant to noise. So here are lots of noisy input images. And all of these input images are mapped to this one image in the hidden layer. So you've created an invariant representation, which can then be used. You can then map this down to something else in the network. And this is how these uh, convolutional neural networks work. They start with very simple invariant representations or detectors for things happening in the image. So in your first layer, you get sort of edge detectors which detect whether there's an edge at some point in the image. Oops. 
and it uses those as features to build up more complicated detectors. So you get facial feature detectors, which detect eyes and noses in different rotations. And it uses those to build up even more complex feature detectors, like ones for faces. Here's another example from a, a publication. There's a link in the uh, slides, the PDF for the slides. Uh, this is for a slightly bigger network uh, for that's trained on more different, uh, uh, more varied data on just a big data set of lots of different images. And they've just picked a random node and they've looked at which images from the data set or from the test set cause that node to activate, cause that node to have a high activation value. In this case they were pictures of birds. So this is a node for recognizing birds. Whenever the input image has a input image has a bird, this node somewhere down the network spikes, has a high activation value. And what you can also do is you can search through gradient descent or anything else for an input image that causes that particular neuron to spike. You forget about the rest of the network, you just look for some input image that causes a big activation in that output neuron. And then you get these kind of trippy images. So this is the ideal image for this neuron. And you see lots of bird-like shapes, but nothing, uh, yeah. But it's also kind of sort of weird. Uh, you can also do it the other way. So what causes that neuron to have a very negative activation value? And then the images from the data set turn out to contain lots of dogs. And remember, none, none of this is supervised, supervised, right? So the image, the network was just trained to classify images and given a big bag of images and it learned to recognize dogs. And it learned that apparently it's a good idea to see a dog as the opposite of a bird. And this is an uh, image trained to uh, reduce the activation of that neuron as much as possible and then you get a sort of collage of dog faces. So there are lots of examples in this article. It's very, I, I recommend uh, browsing through it. So that's another perspective on deep learning. Deep learning is building multi-layered machine learning models that gradually build up more and more abstract features from raw data. So last thing I want to talk about. Lost my chalk again. So that's the type of layers we see. Last thing I want to talk about very briefly is something called autoencoders which is a different kind of architecture that you can build with um, neural networks that is not a classifier or a regression model. And it's very simple. It's an unsupervised method. Basically what you do is you uh, build, if you want to keep it simple, a three-layer model. So you have your inputs, which in this case is an image. You pass it through a hidden layer, which has fewer nodes than the input. And then you pass it back to the output, which has the same number of nodes as the input. And then you put your training data, your instance, on both sides, well, sorry, on both sides of the network. So the task of the network is to reconstruct the image, just to reproduce the image. But it has to do so by passing it through this bottleneck of fewer hidden nodes. So what you get, if you do this successfully, if you train this for a, uh, for a while with uh, backpropagation, you just put some, um, let's say, mean squared error loss here between, this, between the actual output and the example uh, target output. What you get after a while is an encoder that encodes the data set, the instance of the data, into a low dimensional space in a way that can be decoded. So this is a bit like PCA, right? PCA also allowed us to project the data into a low dimensional space in a way that allowed us to decode it and recover most of the data. Uh, sometimes you want to make your uh, hidden layer bigger than the input. And if you just do uh, build a out straight autoencoder with that, then it can just copy the input and copy it back to the output, so that doesn't work. Uh, what you can do there is a denoising autoencoder. So your input, input is a corrupted version of your data and your output is the clean version of the data. So you're training your neural network to remove this noise. That's just a way to project to bigger spaces if you want to do that. 
And what you can do then is build deep autoencoders. So you do the same thing, but you do it with lots of layers. And maybe with some of these convolutional layers instead of regular deep, uh, densely connected layers. And somewhere in the middle you end up with a very small representation. So every step reduces the dimensionality slightly until you get to the middle where the dimensionality is vastly reduced, for instance, to two dimensions. And then you can plot the output. And ideally, if, it, if everything worked, then uh, so you can plot the data in these coordinates. And ideally, if everything worked, you will get a representation in two dimensions where every data item is clustered together. So the, if the input is faces, then people of this, the person with this face is clustered together and the person with this face is clustered together. Uh, it doesn't have to be faces, it can be any kind of data. For instance, if you use term vectors, so uh, these are um, news group uh, posts, news group articles, where the feature vector is how often a, uh, one of 2,000 words occurs in this article. And this is a, a one of these deep autoencoders trained to project the space to two dimensions. Colored afterwards, the model doesn't have access to the colors. And what you see is that it splits these things into very neat separated groups. Uh, which it didn't, so, so these uh, colors represent the subject and it didn't have access to the subject beforehand. It just had access to word frequencies. And the cool thing, going back to faces, that you can do is this space that you've projected into called the latent space. You can pick any point here and decode it into a new image that is not in your data set. So if you pick two points in your data set and you draw a line between them in the latent space, you pick a bunch of points that are equally spaced on that line, and you decode them, then you get a transformation from this image in your data set to that image in your data set. And if your latent space works well, then it will be a natural transformation and any point you pick in this space will decode to a natural looking face. I didn't have time to actually do this, so I can't show you what it looks like. But that's, uh, we're going to go deeper into this in the second deep learning lecture. And you're going to do this at the end of the fourth worksheet. If you do the fourth worksheet, there's a little bit, something a little bit like this at the end of the lecture. So my last perspective and my last slide is deep learning is to classic machine learning as Lego is to Playmobil. I assume people still play with Legos and Playmobil in your generation. So Playmobil, nothing against Playmobil, but it's basically you get what it, uh, you, uh, it does what it says on the box and it doesn't do anything else. So if I give you a traditional classifier, if I give you a decision tree classifier, you get a classifier and you can't use it for anything else. If I give you something made out of Legos, you can take it apart. You can take it apart and build something else and use your imagination and use your creativity to build whatever you like. Basically, the level of abstraction is lower. So this is built out of Lego blocks and this is just a bus and nothing else. So the level of abstraction is lower, which makes it a little bit more complicated, but it expands what you can do with it. And that's all I had for today. Uh, see you next week for probabilistic models 2. <laughs>